No minister of the gospel should ever stand up here and preach without Jesus holding their hand. There should be the presence the whole time. So I want to let you know how free I feel right now. I don't have to stand before you and be creative and try to articulate and make you laugh and all that because it ain't about me. We've been in a sermon series over these several weeks called God's Word and about how the world has tried to put an attack on this and saying that it's just a book that has errors in it. That we should just read it like any other book. In fact, Shakespeare would be a good person we could read it like. But at the end of the day, it's just a bunch of men diaries put together. But I'm here to tell you that that is not the case. That this book is not just a book. It is literally the breath of God. And it is without error. We talked about how God's word is bread to us. How it will feed us spiritually. How it was water to us. And how it will replenish us spiritually. And how it will give us a bath when we're dirty. We talked about it being the breath We've talked a lot about what God's Word is. Today, I want to talk to you about an, another attack that comes against this Word, that this world is talking about. And I want to show you in God's Word where it's a lie. And we're going to talk about this today. We're going to talk about the word dominion. Now, some of you say, what the heck is dominion? Authority. Authority. God's word is authority. And in this word, it tells you who has the authority and who doesn't. And I want to talk to you about that today. I want to talk to you about how God gave Adam authority. And how Adam gave it to Satan. But how Jesus gets it back. And I hope you're going to be excited today because what I'm going to share with you is truth. And I'm going to tell you right now, you just need to ask the Lord, say, Lord, if my wood is wet, let it be dry because the fire of the Lord burns on dead wood. All right? And here's what I pray right now. Holy Spirit, you must increase and I must decrease. Holy Spirit, open the people's eyes spiritually so they can see your words. And open their ears, Lord, so that they can hear it, Lord, spiritually. In your name. You know, I want to say something real quick. Me and my wife was talking about this. You know, you ever been in conversation, people said things, and you said, okay, well, let's get down to the reality. What re what's the reality? We misunderstand this, okay? Let me, let me explain to you something. This right now, the human is not reality. But we think it is. The reality is you are a spiritual being having a human encounter. So the reality is spirit. So when you read this, you can't just look and say, well, now what's the reality here? What, 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 what do you mean by this? Now, now, we just need to get down to it and make it common. Now, what, what is he really saying here? Let's get practical. Well, reality is, is spirit. Spiritually, a being wrote this to spiritual people. It's always spiritual. There are physical things, but we should first go to what is spiritual. Unfortunately, we go first to what is physical. And I just want to encourage you to retrain yourself because we've been trained wrong. This is not just a book. It's God's Word. Amen? Here's what I'm going to do today, um, which don't seem like no shock to you. We're going to read a lot of verses, okay? I'm not going to have three points today. What I'm going to do is, is we're going to read. And as we read, I'm going to stop. And I'm going to teach you what's happening, okay? And it's very important that you listen today. Uh, if you don't have your Bible, um, then pull it up on your phone. If you don't have it on your phone, it's going to be on the screen, okay? But watch this now, okay? Here's what we're going to do. 
We're going to read a lot, and I want to start off with an encounter. Jesus is going into the desert for 40 days. He is not going to eat or drink anything. Okay, this is right after he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was baptized, and it says the Spirit drew him into the desert, which is a whole message by itself. How many of you ever felt like you've been in a dry place when the Lord told you? Yep. That's crazy how we misunderstand the Lord sometimes. When we ask for the Lord, we think it's going to come in here, and he's coming in here with a box of Pop-Tarts and pancakes. But reality, he's saying, desert sun. This is where he sent Jesus himself. And Satan, the deceiver, the tempter, comes to him. And listen what he says to Jesus. Luke 4, verse 6. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you in their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Did you hear that? Satan said, All authority... I will give you why. How can you give somebody something you don't have? You can't, but it says what? I have it. So Satan is saying to Jesus, I got all the authority because Adam gave it to me. I love Jesus' response. He doesn't. He's like, okay. All right, now... I want you to go, we're going to go back to Genesis 1, verse 28, and we're going to see this transaction happen. Read that. Genesis 1, verse 28. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion. Dominion. Have what? What does dominion mean? Authority. All right, go ahead. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Adam gives dominion to Satan. Satan tells Jesus that I have all the dominion because it's been given to me. This is what it just says. Now, I want to fast forward a little bit. We're going to jump around today. I want to fast forward to the resurrection. Okay, listen to what Jesus says. All right, and this is important. This is uh, commonly referred to. This is going to be Paul's favorite chapter verse in the Bible, the Great Commission, okay? Matthew 28, right before he commissions them, look what he says. Verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Wait a minute. We just read that Satan said he had the authority. We also read that first Adam had it. Now we hear the Son of God saying what? All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Something has happened. What has happened? Here's what I want to do. We're going to do something. Uh, Some of you have heard me talk about this. This is a big word to some people. But we are going to do the proper way to interpret the Bible. Okay, that is we're going to exegete. It's called exegesis the word. So what does that mean, Pastor? That means we're going to let the Bible come out and we're not going to read into the Bible. And we're going to do this today by what's a word called contextual exegesis. We're going to look at the context and we're going to pay attention to what's happening and we're going to let the scriptures come out and tell us what happens. All right, and here's why we're going to do this. We're going to do this because you need to understand what happens on Easter Sunday. You also need to understand that there's an attack against the Word when it comes to this. And we're going to go on, and I'm going to explain it to you a little more. So we're going to be in John chapter 14, John chapter 15, and John chapter 16. And let me give you the context. Many people have been misunderstood about these three chapters. They think that it's talking about the second coming of Jesus. That we'll get these things when Jesus comes back to get everybody. But what we fail to do is we read into it when we do that. If we will take the context and we will let the word come out to us, we'll understand he's not talking about that. 
that he's talking about the resurrection. Now, some of you may not understand that. Just, just stay with me. We're going to let the Word do this, okay? So John 14, 15, and 16 in context is Jesus with his disciples at the Last Supper. And for three chapters, it records Jesus' conversation and what happens in this room. So let's start off with Jesus in the Last Supper in John chapter 14, verse 1 and 2. Let's read. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Okay, hold on. Now let me explain that to you. All right, the New King James and the King James Version is the only time that they use the word mansions. It really means dwelling place. So what is he saying? That I am going to make a dwelling place for you in the Lord's house. Because when Adam gave over authority, he lost the, pra- the place of the presence. But Jesus is telling his disciples, what? That in my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. And I'm going to go buy every one of them for you. This is so awesome, I'll tell you. Y'all don't have a clue what's about to happen here, but I love this. Go ahead, babe. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Well, what's the context? I go to prepare a place for you. Here's the context. Jesus is with his disciples at the Last Supper. He's about to be beaten. He's about to be whipped. He's about to be crucified. But he's also about to raise from the dead. You need to understand fully what has happened on Easter Sunday, okay? I want you to understand this. Easter Sunday is not just about he has risen. Something happened, guys, that really we don't fully grasp happened. John 14, verse 25 through 29. Let's keep going. These things I've spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to you your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. Listen, you see that? I'm going away and coming back. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father, Mm. for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. Okay, I want you to do me a favor, if you can. I want you to remember two words. Holy Spirit, peace. What two words I want you to remember? Okay, what else is Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying, I'm about to tell you boys what's about to happen before it happens. I don't want you to be caught off guard when this happens. I also want you to know that when I go away, I'm coming back to you. He wants them to know this. And when he comes back, it says this right here. That when it comes to past, you may believe. Listen to me. When Jesus resurrected from the grave, ain't nobody going to have a problem believing. They saw him beat. They saw him hang. And Jesus came back for not just a day, but he came back for several weeks. They believed. All right, let's go now to John 16, verse 16 through 20. Look here what happens. A little while and you will not see me. All right. A little while. He's not talking thousands of years. When I tell my wife I'll be back in a little while. Yeah, she's like, I hope it's not thousands of years. No, it's not going to be thousands of years. It's a little while. I'll be back in just a little bit. All right. A little while. Keep going. 
a little while and you will not see me. And again a little while and you will see me because I go to the Father. Then some of his disciples said among themselves, what is this that he says to us a little while and you will not see me and again a little while and you will see me and because I go to the Father, they said therefore, what is this that he says a little while? We do not know what he's saying. Now Jesus knew that they desired to ask him and he said to them, are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said a little while and then you will not see me and again a little while and you will see me? Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will, re will rejoice mm. and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Listen to that. Did y'all hear that last part? You will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. What happened when Jesus got crucified? They wept, but the world rejoiced. But your sorrow will be turned to joy. Why? Because he got up. And he came back. This ain't talking about when Jesus comes back in two, however many years it takes. We're not talking about that. In context, Jesus is talking about he's going to be back in just a few days. Three to be exact. Now, like I told you again, we must remember the context. They wept and they lament. But the joy is coming. Let's go to verse 22. Chapter 16, verse 22. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. Mm. Now I want us to go to the resurrection. John chapter 20, verse 1. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early. Okay, well, listen, when is this? At the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb while it was still dark. So what does this mean? Early in the morning. Early in the morning, she went here. Okay, go ahead. While it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Go to verse 11 through 14. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet. Listen, this is so cool to me. Some of you are going to enjoy this. Some of you are going to look at me and not know. Mm -hmm. What just happened? What did she see? She saw an angel where? So at the head and at the feet. What is this symbolic of? The Ark of the Covenant. This is literally a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. Angels on both sides in the presence of God in the center. That's right. You got that for free, by the way. You'll go ahead. <laughs> One at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they've taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Watch. Now, when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Mm. Keep going. Jesus said to her. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. I can't go past this. This woman just said she did, that he did, she did not recognize him. Nor did she recognize his voice. Now, that's, that should be a little alarming to you. We're talking about a woman who literally walked with Jesus for three and a half years and she did not recognize him. It's, all right, so here's what some people have told me. Well, that's because he was so badly beaten, she wouldn't have recognized him. Well, the only problem I have with that is, is the word says that she helped take him off the cross. So she saw what he looked like. Keep going. Verse 15 through 17. I want to say it like, woman, why are you weeping? Yeah. Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you the have gardener. carried him away, tell me where he, you have laid him, and I will take him away. Has anybody ever seen a gardener? We don't really see gardeners that much. Let's just talk about the lawn care guy that's been working all day. Usually at the end of the day of a lawn care, what do they look like? Dirty. 
They got dirt all over them. What did Jesus do when he went on the cross? He took all the sin. He's literally standing here dirty with sin all over him. Watch what happens next. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabbi, I. Something is, happened that we don't know, but he turned her eyes open. Which is to say, teacher. Yeah. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mm. Do not cling to me. Why? Because I haven't went to the Father yet. That word cling translates to touch. It's also the same word that is described when the woman that had the issue of blood reached out and clinged to the hem of his garment. She touched it. What is Jesus saying? Don't touch me. I haven't went to the Father yet. Do not touch me. But... Go tell them boys that's thick-headed. Remember I told you that something was going to happen. Go tell them. This is so encouraging that I am ascending to my father and who's? Your father. My God and your God. So don't touch me because I'm ascending now. Now I'm ascending. Verse 19 to 20. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and he said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So, where was Jesus going when he ascended? Where was he going? Well, the word tells us he was going to his father. But Jesus comes into the room, and what was the words I told you to remember? Peace and... So, what is happening here? What is happening here? Let's read verse 21 and 22. I'm about to show you. So Jesus said to them again, peace be to you, or peace to you, excuse me, yes. as the Father has sent me. Okay, what just happened there? I'm sorry to keep cutting you off, but this is important. I want you to see this. Who sent him? So that means he must have been there then. Okay, keep going. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. What was those two words? Peace and the Holy Spirit. So let's pay attention to context. Jesus is seen by Mary and he said, don't touch me because I am ascending to where? The Father. Just a little bit later... He comes back, it says, later that evening. He comes back in the room and says, the Father has sent me. And he showed him his hands. So what's he saying now? Touch me. Touch me. Now you can touch me. Because I went and done what I needed to do. Now you can touch me. Before he went to the Father, he said, don't touch me. He's come back. Now he's saying, touch me. A few days later, Thomas wasn't there. Thomas comes back. And what does he tell Thomas? Come put your hands right here in this hole. Touch me. <laughs> I'm going to the Father. Here's what he's done. All right? Here, here's what Jesus has literally done and what he said to them boys. I'm going to the Father. Because in his house, there's a lot of land. And I'm going to buy all that land. And I'm going to pay for it with my blood. And I'm going to build you a house on it. So that you'll have somewhere to live again with my father. 
That's what he was telling them, guys. He's not talking about when he comes back in the cloud to gather us. He's telling the disciples right now that I come back to do all these things, and it's now done. So how does Jesus pay for all of this in heaven? Well, the Bible tells us. Hebrews 9, verse 12. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Not with blood from goats. Not with money. Not nothing from this world. But with his own blood. He went into heaven and baptized it and cleansed it and paid and bought everybody in here a place to dwell with the Father. You need to understand something. When Adam sinned, we lost the presence. We were kicked out of the garden. The word Eden literally translates to the very presence of God. We lost it. And Jesus goes and buys it for us. Now, I want you to understand something. There's something incredible that happens in between all this, and I want to show this to you. Uh, Ephesians tells us a little bit about it. Let's, let's read Ephesians uh, 4, verse 8. This is why the Scriptures say, when he ascended on high, he led captiv captivity captive yep. and gave gifts to them. He led captivity. It says when he ascended right after he died on the cross something happened he led captivity captive what does that mean well I don't know if some of you remember this or not but there was a a evil rich man who had a dream and what did he say I saw a beggar in the very arm the bosom of Abraham so what does that mean? That means that that man saw Abraham in a place waiting for Jesus. And Jesus, right when he dies on the cross, here's what he done. He went there and he looked at the devil and said, okay, give me the keys. Give me the keys. Your time's up. I'm taking authority back. That's what happens. And he's going to lead captivity to the Father. That's what it says. All right, now here's what you need to know. Now, I'm going to blow your mind here. Some of you may have known this and some of you may not. Here comes a nugget that you don't pay attention to in Scripture. When Jesus goes and gets them, here's what he's telling them. He says, guys, before we go to the Father, I got to make a stop. I got to go tell this woman to remind the boys that what I said was going to happen is going to happen. Now, everybody knows. Well, say, well, why did he tell a woman this? Well, everybody understands if you want something done right, you get a woman to do it, right? That was for you, ladies. Y'all should have shouted me down on that. I thought you were going to say because you know we talk. No. Uh, so, so here's the deal. Here's the cool part. Listen to me. So what does the saints do that were with Jesus? They say, well, Jesus, while you're talking to her, is it okay if we go look around Jerusalem for a little bit? You're like, what are you talking about, Pastor? Your Bible says that the saints got up out of the grave and walked through the city when Jesus had them. So what happened? Abraham walked through Jerusalem and was like, you see that right there, Jeremy? That's where we played basketball. They got a Walmart there now, but we played basketball over there when I was on this earth. And what is the deal with a Starbucks on every corner? You don't believe me? Let me show it to you. Matthew 27, verse 52 and 53. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. You see that? Can you imagine? Can you imagine being in the city and Abraham come right through these doors and say, hey, how y'all doing? Are you new here today? Yeah. What's your name? Abraham. Oh, that's cool. Now, I want you to understand. I'm not just 
and Abraham, I'm the father of many nations. Can you imagine that? You'd be blown away. Revival hit this whole place. That's what happened. That's the power of Jesus. He took the keys of death, hell, and the grave, and he led the saints that had been captive. He led them to the Father. Man, that's just exciting to me. John uh, chapter 12, verse 31. I'm almost done. Pay attention. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. This is what Jesus is talking about. Listen to this, because we're done. I'm going to show you this, what happened on Easter Sunday. Now the judgment of this world, now the ruler of this world will be cast out. That's what's been to happen. Now, wouldn't it be cool if there was scriptures telling us play by play what happened during this time? Wouldn't that be awesome? Well, there is. Let's go there. All right, and here's what you want to know. I want, we're going to read what happens from Sunday morning to Sunday night. From the time Jesus says, don't touch me, to the time he walks in and says, now you can touch me. Look what happens. Daniel, Daniel chapter 7. Now, some of us have said, well, man, Daniel's foretelling about what's in the book of Revelations. Well, you just don't understand. Okay, I'm going to explain it to you as we go, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about this. Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 11. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was mm. seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. Mm. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Mm. Ten thousand times ten thousand so stood before him. So that's a million and ten million. You don't know. So there was a million and then 10 million angels ministered. That's a lot of folks. And that ain't even probably half of them. Of angels, the army of the Lord. Keep going, babe. The court was seated and the books were opened. Mm. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. That's Satan, by the way. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Now, some of you may be saying, well, wait, there it is, Pastor. He's talking about the beast. That's going to line up with Revelation. That's what these people are saying. Here's what you need to understand. You need to understand in Daniel there are four beasts. There are four different beasts he's talking about. This is one. I'm going to explain to you what this beast is. Go ahead and finish. That was it. Okay. So what beast was it? Sin. On Easter Sunday, sin was defeated. That beast was slain. Okay? Now why am I saying this? Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law but under grace. So what happened on Easter Sunday? On Easter Sunday... He took the authority back. He took the authority that sin has had on your life away from Satan. So he got it back. You are no longer under that anymore. Why am I saying this? I'm telling you this because Satan been lying to a bunch of you in here. He ain't got no authority over you like that no more. I'm telling you this. You need to listen the devil is lying to you. Well, I've messed up this bad, Pastor. I've got an addiction. I've got this going on. I blah, blah, blah. Let me tell you something. He's lying to you. Jesus has beat him and took dominion, authority away from him. And now we're not under that curse anymore, but we're under grace. What is grace? God's undeserving favor. Hmm. Let's go to uh, Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. See, those are the other three. 
they had their authority taken away too, but the Lord said, I ain't going to take you out yet. I'm going to make you suffer a little longer. Keep going. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. Mm. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. So hold on one second. Let me, let me make sure I, I, I paint you a picture because I don't want you to think I just threw the saints in there a while ago. What did it just say? The Son of Man is coming with the clouds of heaven. What is he talking about here? Well, Hebrews chapter 11 starts off with, we are gathered by such a great cloud of witnesses. He's talking about the saints. This is Jesus coming with the saints in the courtroom. Because we just read in the ancients of, ancient of days. The ancient of days is God Almighty. He come and sit down at the seat of judgment. Keep going. He came to the ancient of days, mm. and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. Mm. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Mm. That's the promise. So there was a courtroom setting. The horn, Satan, was in the room and the saints were over here. And the horn, Satan, was just spitting lies and accusations. And it says that he was winning against the saints. And the ancient of days, the judge, was sitting there listening to all of it. And Jesus comes in the room. Can I just reenact this for you real quick, what happened? I need to have some help. Come here, Sean. Help me out, brother. You'll be a good one. Many people know, Sean, how God's just transformed his life. You're going to represent the saints, okay? And I'm going to represent Satan. And you're standing before God Almighty. God, you do know who's standing in front of you right here, right? That's Sean. That's Sean Headley, the Aryan brother, the one who basically got white power wrote all over him, the drug addict. That's who we're talking about here. You gonna let him in? The one I'm talking about. We're talking about Sean Headley here. We're talking about a man. How dare him stand in God's presence for how he's acted? You ain't even worthy to be in God's presence. How do you think you're going to come in here just because you said a little prayer? What makes you feel like you can stand before God Almighty? You ain't fooling nobody. And the whole time, God is sitting here like this, just looking at you. But something happens, Sean. In the middle of the Satan accusing you, it says Jesus walks in the courtroom. And here's the Ancient of Days. And he sees the beaten, bloody body of Jesus Christ walk in the room. And when he walks in the room, he hears Satan saying these things about you. And he says, can I object, Daddy? Go ahead, son. Daddy, I hear what everything Satan has been saying to him. But if it's okay with you, I want to pay for it. And here's the blood. And the ancients of days go, <laughs> Satan, you lose. Sean, you win. Be free in the name of Jesus. And that is what happens on Easter Sunday. You need to know that Satan has no authority over you anymore. You need to understand this. Sean, you need to know that Satan has no authority over you anymore. The price was paid when he said, it is finished. The Ancient of Days said, I agree. Courts dismissed. That's what happened.
and you just walk on out, brother, and enjoy your dwelling place that I paid for. That's what happened. Now, here's what you need to know. The only way Satan gets authority back is if you give it to him. I want everybody to stand to your feet. Here's what I want you to know. I want you to know that many of us in this room, there's areas in, our, in your life where you have given Satan authority. But I'm telling you right now, if you are obedient and you turn to Jesus and you make a stand right here and say, I will not let Satan have any more authority over me right now in my seat, I say I take it back in the name of Jesus. You'll get it back. So if we can, we'll get some music playing. If you are bold enough to come up here and say, I need Jesus. I'm taking back what Satan had over me. From this day forward, I give him no authority over my life. No addiction, no lie, no hurt, no unforgiveness, no bitterness, nothing will rob me any longer. I take it back because Jesus took it and he'll have it for eternity.